Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we're discussing three National Park cold case mysteries. Let's get into it. Number 1. Armand B. Johnson On April 13, 2005, a passerby stumbled upon a gruesome discovery in an otherwise beautiful and scenic location. At the southern edge of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, Near Kahuku Ranch lay the body of 44-year-old Armand B. Johnson. He was discovered wearing a tank top, shorts, socks, and slippers, and was about 100 yards off the Maumahoa Highway. Investigators determined that he had been killed by a single gunshot to the back of the neck, and that he likely died in the same spot his body was found. There was no evidence to suggest that his body had been moved, nor any effort to conceal the body. In the 17 years since his murder, Armand's killer has never been found, and the motive for the crimes has not been determined. His vehicle, which was described as an old beater, was never found. Still, Armand's friends do have some opinions about it. They called his death an execution. Some of them knew that he used drugs recreationally and wondered if that might have had something to do with his murder. Still, they don't feel that drugs alone would explain what had happened to him, especially considering he was known and loved by so many on the island. Everybody loved him, retired police sergeant Samson Wana said in a statement to the media. He could meet you today, and you would end up liking him. Armand had relocated to the Big Island from Seattle, Washington in 1984, where he worked as a massage therapist and hosted a reggae music show on a local radio station. He also worked as an aide to autistic children. His friends recalled his loud, boisterous voice that could be heard across a room and his easily likable personality. He was last seen two days before his body was discovered. He had been seen leaving work and told a co-worker he was headed home, but he never made it there. His friends described him as a harmless man that was very trusting. In 2015, 10 years after the murder, all leads eventually went cold. The FBI announced a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of Armand Johnson's killer in hope that the passage of time and a monetary reward would embolden a witness to come forward. Seven years later, neither an arrest or conviction has occurred. The Honolulu FBI is still looking for tips that would solve this mystery and bring Armand's killer to justice. The FBI is still looking for tips that will solve this mystery and break Armand's killer to justice. FBI Special Agent in Charge Paul D. Delacourt said, A decade has passed since the murder of Armand Johnson. We are hoping that the passage of time may embolden a witness to come forward and tell us the truth about how and why this tragic act of violence occurred. Number 2. Julianne Williams and Lolly Winans on May 19, 1996, 24-year-old Julianne Julie Williams and 26-year-old Laura Lolly Winans were a young couple with a passion for the outdoors, embarking on their latest hike together in the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. Julie and Lolly were both experienced hikers and skilled outdoor guides, having been on dozens of similar hikes. They had even led victims of sexual assaults on hiking and camping trips as a therapeutic experience. About two weeks after they left for their hike, family and friends had not heard from them and realized they had not returned from their hiking trip on the date they had planned to. The family reported Julie and Lolly missing to park authorities, who began their search on Bridal Trail, a lesser-used trail in the Shenandoah National Park, where the women had told family they would be hiking. Then, on June 1st, loved ones received the worst news imaginable when Julie and Lolly's bodies were found by park rangers at their campsite wrapped in sleeping bags. According to media reports from the time, they had been tied up and their throats had been cut. Lolly's golden retriever, Taj, who had been hiking with them, was located wandering the trail.
Direct. Oh, you're not gonna spend the night here? No. Hundreds of tips came into the FBI in the aftermath of the murders, and they soon landed on a suspect. However, it wasn't until 2002 when Attorney General John Ashcroft announced in a press conference that 34-year-old Daryl David Rice, who had already been in jail for another assault in the same park, had been indicted for Julian Lawley's murders. Ashcroft labeled their deaths as a hate crime since Julian Lawley were a same-sex couple and Rice apparently despised LGBTQ plus people. Unfortunately, the DNA testing proved inconclusive, and the evidence linking Rice to the crimes was purely circumstantial. Phone records had shown he had called a California support group for LGBTQ plus people, which Julie had written about in her diaries. The connection sparked the idea that the two women had been stalked and targeted by Rice. Without any forensic evidence placing Rice at the crime scene, the Department of Justice ended up dismissing the case, and he never went to trial for the murders. More than a quarter century later, Julie and Lolly's killers have not been brought to justice, and their murders remain unsolved. Their case has been covered in countless podcasts, articles, and even in a successful book. Author Catherine Miles covered the Shenandoah National Park cold cases in her book titled trailed one woman's quest to solve the Shenandoah murders. She retraced the young woman's steps and took a deep dive into the evidence and the initial investigation. She believes another man, Richard Mark Ivanovitz, who was a serial killer, Ivanovitz killed himself in 2002, right before he was arrested in another crime. About five years ago, the FBI renewed its public outreach in search of tips and leads to help solve the case. Because the park is visited by people from all over, those who were nearby at the time of the murders could be from anywhere in the country or world. Those who may have information have been asked to call the FBI. It's been over 20 years since St. Cloud native Julie Williams and Lolly Winans of Unity, Maine were found murdered in the Virginia park. The FBI is still looking for tips to find who's responsible. We're using this opportunity, uh, the 20 year anniversary to let folks know that the case is still a pending FBI investigation and uh, you know we are looking for leads we're looking for new evidence there's somebody somebody that knows something uh, and hopefully some relationship will change and somebody out there will feel the guilt or uh, come forward to do the right thing Julie and Lolly were last seen alive on May 24th 1996 hiking with their dog at Shenandoah National Park Virginia Julie was born and raised in St. Cloud and graduated from Cathedral High School in 1990 this is a case that was enormously uh, emotional for our region and frankly for my agents and for this office the folks that are assigned to it now were assigned to it decades ago Julie had a passion for the outdoors, sports, and social justice. She and her best high school friend Becky won the state doubles title for Cathedral in tennis their senior year. Her friends, teachers, and family to this day say the horrific double murder is something they will never forget. This isn't the St. Cloud world that we all knew. Uh, this terrible thing had happened in a distant place and it brought us uh, a dose of, of, of the world that we just didn't really couldn't relate to. We did get together once when uh, we were both in college and um, of course it was always good to see her but yeah when I finally got that news I of course was devastated that I you know we hadn't seen each other more throughout those years after after high school. Her father Tom says Julie got along with just about everyone and usually cared for others above herself. Yeah she did uh, with everybody it's been a lot of years uh, of course and you hold on to the memories. No one has been exonerated in this case, and so we are, we are, our aperture is wide open. We are looking at anyone that had any relationship to the events on the Shenandoah 20 years ago that took the lives of these two ladies. Before the charges were dropped, prosecutors said that Rice targeted Williams and Winans because of his hate of women and homosexuals. The FBI won't comment on specific suspects now, but the case is still being investigated as a hate crime. There's 
certainly some indication that they were targeted sort of pursuant to a, a, a hatred of the, their lifestyle or their choices. And that is something that was certainly covered in that press conference. And I think that's certainly how we still scope the case. After hearing the horrible news, Tom visited the site where his daughter was killed. He says it was a beautiful area out east and that the tragedy tainted a tranquil scene. Part of that, uh, I did want to see it was important to me to see where she died. And uh, so, you know, I, I was in the park, stayed in the park, uh, and uh, one of the cabins there, and had access to all of the people in the park that knew Julie and uh, that um, and that also uh, knew her story. A beautiful little area down by a stream and uh, that's where she died. Over 20 years later, Tom says he still hopes answers and closure are found. He also hopes the community will continue to talk about the good memories that Julie left behind. To talk to people, to say, you know, just that, that I remember this story about Julie, or why Julie would have laughed at that. I think uh, being in touch with the people uh, who have had a loss is very important. They certainly don't forget. Number three, Bobby Bizup. Located in the Rocky Mountains National Park, just outside Allen's Park, Colorado, Camp St. Malo was an all-boys Catholic summer camp established in the 1930s. It later became co-ed in the 1970s, before being converted to a treat space in the 1980s. Eventually, the scenic chapel and grounds became a popular wedding venue, with sweeping views of the Rocky Mountains, but this beautiful place has a dark history associated with it. On August 15, 1958, at Camp St. Mallow, a 10-year-old camper named Bobby Bizup disappeared. This was especially troubling to the staff and his parents because Bobby was born almost completely deaf. According to statements from the priests running the camp, Bobby had been fishing and had failed to follow a counselor and other boys back to the main lodge for dinner. A search party went out that night, and within days, hundreds of people, aided by bloodhounds and aircrafts, were in the woods looking for the boy. Bobby was not found as quickly as had been hoped. It was assumed that Bobby must have wandered off, because he couldn't hear anyone calling or looking for him, he continued wandering in the wrong direction and got lost. In the days and weeks that followed, hope that Bobby was still alive seemed less and less possible. When they did find him, it would only be his bones, as Bobby's remains were not located for over a year. His remains were discovered on the east face of Mount Meeker, which was some distance from the camp. The initial coroner's report classified Bobby's death as an accident and determined he had likely died from exhaustion and exposure. This is what his family believed for 60 years. Both of his parents would die believing their only son's death was nothing more than a tragic accident. It was only decades and decades later that this original assumption would come into question. Not because of any new forensic evidence, because of new information that little by little began to come out about the camp in the years that followed. It was uncovered that three of the seminarians at the camp had been accused of sexually assaulting multiple young boys, with two of them, Harold Robert White and Neil Hewitt, were described as serial child abusers. White molested at least 70 children in his two decades as a priest, and Hewitt was accused of molesting at least nine. Hewitt was the last person to see Bobby alive, and also the person who later found his remains a year after his disappearance. Hewitt insists that he did not harm Bobby, and White died in 2006, long before the investigation was opened. A third priest, Jerry Repola, also deceased, had only one known incident of sexual assault, but was frequently moved around different parishes, leading investigators to wonder if he had other victims and was being protected by the church. Though none of these men were known murderers, the presence of all of them at the camp when Bobby went missing necessitated a criminal investigation be open to look into it further. So in 2020, the National Park Services opened an investigation 
into Bobby's death over 60 years after his body was found. While new information regarding the investigation has not yet been released, and it is made much more difficult by the fact that many of those involved have since died, the police continue to seek out new leads that will help them identify Bobby's killer. They are asking anyone who's willing to come forward who may have information, anyone who tended the camp with Bobby, to call the National Park Service. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. As always, if you give this video a little like, if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated as it is the easiest way to help the channel grow. We also have channel membership as well as Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content or exclusive content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you also find links to all my socials as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you on the next one. Bye for now.